Terima kasih Ya Arif Datuk Haji Muhyiddin Ibrahim Director General and Syariah Chief Justice Department of Syariah Judiciary Malaysia Yang berbahagia Profesor Datuk Dr. Musa Ahmad Vice Chancellor University Sains Islam Malaysia Our honor speaker today Yang berbahagia Profesor Dr. Haji Abdul Samad Musa Fakulti of Syariah Law Yusim Yang berbahagia Profesor Datuk Dr. Zulkifri Abdul Ghani Deputy Vice Chancellor Academy and International Yusim Yang berbahagia Profesor Datuk Dr. Hassan Basri Awam Madahat Deputy Vice Chancellor Student Press and Alumni Yang berbahagia Profesor Datuk Dr. Roshada Hashim Deputy Vice Chancellor Research Innovation Members of the Yusim Board of Directors Yusim Management Officials Professors Distinguished Guests Ladies and Gentlemen Alhamdulillah All praise to Allah By whose grace and blessings We are gathered here today for the Sharia, for the Sharia and Pradana, Professor Dr. Hadi Abdul Samad Musa, a Professor at the Faculty of Sharia and Law, University of Science Foundation. It is indeed a great honor for the Faculty of Sharia and Law to be able to organize this premier lecture. And on behalf of the organizer, may I extend a warm welcome to everyone to Sharia and Pradana, Professor Dr. Hadi Abdul Samad Musa, and. We are deeply gratified to the show of support <coughs> Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, with our series of lectures, the Faculty of Sharia and Law aims to promote legal scholarships, discourse and debate in forums that enrich our community. We believe that the lectures, especially this premier lecture, attract students, faculty members, legal scholars and practitioners as well as community members interested in the issues affecting the community and public life. We aim to educate and promote knowledge of Sharia and law among the public and this lecture is a good avenue to spread greater understanding of the Malaysian constitutions and Islamic constitutional theory. This lecture is a timely effort considering various constitutional issues being discussed in various media. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, we are pleased to announce that the Legal Profession Qualifying Board, LPQB, has finally awarded recognition to our undergraduate program, <laughs> and Professor Dr. Haji Abdul Sam Musa was the person responsible to head FSU to introduce the programs in 2005. Inshallah, we will be offering new programs, Bachelor of Sharia and Hala Industry, Master in International Law by Coursework, and PhD in Law in the near future. All these are made possible due to the shared vision and teamwork spirit of all FSU members, including our precious students. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to express our heartfelt gratitude to using stock <coughs> management, the organizing committee, and all guests for coming and our heartiest congratulations to our beloved professor Dr. Haji Abdul Samad Musa for this special event. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Dengan nama Allah yang mengasih dan maaf Dengan salam dan salam Kita pandangkan Kejujuran Kepada Rasulullah SAW Allah masanya Nasih kita Nama Yang mengarif Dato' Haji Muhyiddin Ibrahim Director General And Syariah Asif Justice Department of Syariah Judiciary Malaysia Our honored speakers For today Yang berbahagia Profesor Dato' Haji Abu Samad Musa, Faktor Syariah and Law Musi, yang berbahagia Profesor Dr. Dr. Zulkif Abu Ghani, Deputy Vice Chancellor Academy and International, yang berbahagia Profesor Dr. Dr. Hassan Basri Awam Madahan, Deputy Vice Chancellor Student Affairs and Alumni, yang berbahagia Profesor Dr. Dr. Roshan Hashim, Deputy Vice Chancellor Research and Innovations, Prosim Adia Dr. Zikri Hassan, Dean of the Faculty of Sharia and Law, <coughs> members of the UC Board of Directors, 
kasih untuk Fuad kepada tak pada yang muat ini. UC management officials, GKPU professors, distinguished guests, judges and gentlemen, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Dan salam kita kerasi untuk nakli dan nakli. It really gives me a great pleasure okay, to welcome all of you to an installation of the inaugural lecture series in UC, which on this auspicious occasion will be delivered by a prominent figure in Pankoshara and Law, UC, the Prabahagia Professor Dr. Professor Dr. Haji Abu Sabah Musa. Mr. I'm really very pleased and humbled to witness the positive response in terms of attendance of the audience to me. So, on behalf of UC Management, I wish to warmly thank all of you here for your presence. So, UC is very proud to host this event where illustrious academicians in UC who expert in their respective discipline share their knowledge and experience on the wide range of contemporary and significant issues that address various important aspects affecting both the local and international communities at large. So this type of platform is an integral component towards achieving a useful objective of educating our academics and the wider academic audience on major and current development in different topics news and discoveries. So to achieve this, we strongly embrace our unique vision of assimilating the trivial knowledge and human knowledge of what we term as the integration of NAC and NAC knowledge. So this is the underlying philosophy that drives and empowers this university to continuously strive to be a progressive academic institution that is holistic and committed in upholding religious principles and brothers' values in pursuing, disseminating, and applying knowledge. Here at UC, we are keen to initiate, to steer, and to participate in intellectual discourses to foster an environment, uh, to foster an environment that provides not only a conducive space for present and future generations to learn and enrich themselves but also a conduit that connects and allows them to empower members of society at every level through knowledge and also innovation. So it is our hope that inaugural lectures such as we to have today will continuously inspire and stimulate our academics and students to explore new research frontiers and to witness the exciting participation in contributing ideas and solutions that will benefit at all levels of the Puma. So distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, today we are privileged to have the Amber Bahagia Professor Haji Abdul Samad Musa from the Kandashara and Law to deliver this lecture entitled Islam, a State and the Constitution in Malaysia and Islam Constitutional Theory the relationship and challenges. So, it looks very complicated, it sounds very complicated, but I hope we will cross something we ever I mean, to, to make it simpler for us to understand okay, what, what you mean that we want to convey this morning. So, so, please allow me to walk you through the impressive background and profile of our speaker today. Professor Mutaamro Salmat Musa was born in Kotobau, Planta, of Planta Diko. Uh, on the 19th of March, 1951, and he received his education at Madrasa Al Tarbia Al Mardia and Al Mahat Al Muhammadi in Kota Baru before continuing his studies at Batalim Jaya and Klang Muslim College. At a tertiary, tertiary level, he studied at University of Al Malaysia, where he obtained a Bachelor of Islamic Studies in Sharia. 1976. So his, his subsequent postgraduate degrees in Diploma in Education from University of Malaysia 
in, 16, uh, in 1976. A Master of Law LLM from University of Malaya in 1980 and PhD in Law from the University of Manchester in the Kingdom in 1989. So he started his academic career in July 1976 at UKM as a tutor and later was appointed as a lecturer and subsequently an as a professor in 1997. So his first experience in academic administration began at the same institution with his appointment as a coordinator of two postgraduate diploma programs, one of which was offered together with an Islamic organization in Singapore and later as the head of the Department of Sharia and Deputy Academic and Student Affairs at the Faculty of Islamic Studies at UKM. So he was appointed a professor and transferred to Husin, then Queen of College University of Islam Malaysia in July 2002. Professor Dr. Haji Abdul Samad Musa is a former long serving dean in the Faculty of Sharia and Law of Husin holding office from the years 2002 until 2012, so more or less it's the decade. And was responsible for its rebranding and introduction of an integrated academic and professional program of Sharia and civil law. He was the founding director of the World Fatwa Management and Research Institute or Inshot in Fad at UC for five years from 2003 to 2008. During his tenure as a deputy dean in UK and as a dean in Lucy, Professor Dr. Haji Abdul Samad Musa was privileged to have been invited to join several academic visits to countries abroad, namely Brunei Darussalam, Indonesia, Egypt, Dubai, the Republic of Maldives, Thailand, and Singapore to promote and enhance academic programs. So he was also part of the delegation of Jabatan Kermaduan Islam Malaysia Jakim to visit slaughter houses and Islam organizations in Australia and New Zealand. Professor Dr. Haji Abdul Samad Musa is a former member of the Sharia Advisory Council of Securities Commission Malaysia for the years 2008 until 2010 and the National Fatwa Council again from 2004-2007. He is also a former chairman of the Sharia Committee of RSP Islamic Member Hadi <coughs> and Ben Pembangunan Malaysia Berhad. So he also acted as a panel member of Jatan Kuasa Tabet Urus Index Sharia Malaysia and Jatan Kuasa Induk Pendidikan Index Sharia Malaysia. At present, Professor Dr. Haji Abdul Samad Musa sits as the chairman of the Sharia Panel Committee of UCI the first of its kinds in public universities. He is also a panel member of Intellectual Anemadis Da'wah Negara and a member of the editorial board of Journal Kanun and the Dewan Bahasa dan Pustaka. His areas of expertise are Sharia Law, Islamic and Cooperative Constitutional and Administrative Law, Human Rights and the Administrations of Islamic Law in Malaysia. He has written and researched extensively in these areas and presented papers in conferences at national and international levels, including as an invited speaker and has also published work in books and reputed journals. So Professor Dr. Haji Abdul Samad Musa has also been actively involved in the evaluation of application for his grant and accreditation of the program as a panel member under the Ministry of Higher Education. Apart from being a member of the academic panel for academic programs and assessment in several local universities, in 2013, he was appointed as external assessor at College University of Rural Bukamun, Sivagawan, Jerusalem. In the same year, he was invited by the Muslim World League, Rabita Al-Alam Al-Islami, of Saudi Arabia to perform Hajj and prior to Hajj presented a working paper on human rights in the 14th Mecca Conference on Human Rights in Sharia International Institutes. 
Professor Dr. Aji Abdul Samad is married, so not available already. To Buat Haja Nur Aduni binti Haji Hussein and is blessed with six children and seven grandchildren. So his success as a doting father is reflected in the impressive achievement of his children. A first is first born Dr. Mutatila Najihan is a lecturer and clinical microbiologist at Pusat Perbatan Musi Kebangsaan Malaysia. So his second son, Abu Mun Im Shakiran, is currently a senior analyst programmer with Dechel Asia Malaysia Shangrahan. His eldest daughter, Shukurina Imtiaz, is a lecturer at Usin, where he all puts a mother inside. I also don't know about this. <laughs> <laughs> and his youngest son, Nasiruddin Azizi, served as a project architect at the architectural firm and the architect in Kuala Lumpur. And his daughter, Nur Alwani, is, is a dedicated and successful homemaker and his youngest child, Shahira Fadina, is probably a product of Usu. She is a family student pursuing a Bachelor of Muamala Administration at the Faculty of Economic in Muamala. And now, she is undergoing practical training at the headquarters of Bengaya in Kuala Lumpur. So, Pro Abrazam is truly a strong supporter of Usu. <laughs> So, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, on that note and with the recitation of Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, it gives me a great pleasure to appreciate this auspicious event, so without a further ado, it is my honor to call upon the Prabhagya, Professor Dr. Haji Abdul Samad Musa, to deliver his inaugural lecture. So, please join me in the Islam, particularly in Malacca, in 
the 15th century had a significant impact on Malaysian constitutional history. In the words of Andrew Hamid, in order to understand the constitutional consequences and the importance of religion and the contemporary debates around it, it is necessary to trace the place of religion to Malaysian history. No discussion of Malaysian history at present in Malaysia would be complete without the history reference to Islam and influences. There has been a growing interest in the political and constitutional debates about the position of Islam in the constitution and its relationship with the state. The purpose of this lecture is to examine the nature and threat of the relationship between Islam and state and the constitution of Malaysia. Particularly the place, influence and importance of Islam in the federal constitution and to describe and to determine the character of the state based on historical account and the present provisions of the federal and state constitution. The word Islam as it appears in the title is not only confined to its legal aspect but religion of Islam in its totality. Since the determination of the nature of state in any in my view also requires a clear understanding of the content, the concept of Islamic State and Constitution. Some reference to the Islamic political and constitutional theories in the light of the objective of Sharia or Mahasid Sharia and the doctrine of Sharia oriented policy is pertinent and inevitable. The relationships and ch challenges to be examined include the position, role, and the connection of the religion of Islam in the context of state and constitution under the Malaysian constitutional framework. Islam, state, and the constitution in the Islamic constitutional theory particularly the response to constitutional issues in a multiracial and multi-religious Malaysia and the relationship between Islam and state under the federal constitution from the Islamic perspective. Islam is a complete religion comprising three fundamental and inexplicable components. Fundamental religious belief, law and regulation governing various relationships, either in specific rule or guiding principle, and moral or non-legal rule or ethical principle. That it governs for aspects of human relationships and dealing, whether among the people and between the people and the universe, people and God and, and the rulers and the rule, including in particular matters pertaining to constitutional and administrative law or unfit, understood what he did, or truths concerning state and government. In Islam, belief, law, and morality are, however, interlinked and intertwined. In Islamic, in Islamic constitutional perspective, apart from revelation or divine guidance, human reason and involvement of the people are not entirely enough, provided they are free and talent, within the parameters of religion, stipulated rules, and the Mahasid, the Sharia. Right, first, we are looking at the background of the Malaysian constitution. There are several theories on the exact date, place, and means of Islamization in Malaysia. In Malay Archipelago and Malaysia in particular. However, the significant relationship is historically more evident when Parameswara arrived in Malaysia and later converted to Islam in 1414. Regardless of the different opinions on the arrival of Islam, of Islam, it could be 
safe to say that Islam become the religion of Malacca Sultanate in the 15th century. The position of Islam in Germany in the, uh, in the religion of Malacca, as the religion of Malacca and other things, was not um, provided in a written constitution but could be inferred from the political institution, state policies and codified Islamic laws introduced by the state. All states in the peninsula of Malaysia before 1948 used to have a written constitution except the states of Mungano and Johor which promulgated the constitution of 1911 and the constitution of, 19, of 1895 respectively. The traditional Malay constitutions were unwritten, being customary in nature, and some found in ordinary legal codes rather than specific constitutional documents. Thus, the history of constitutionalism, which embodies the concept of the limited government in Malaysia expounded by the English political philosopher of the 17th century, John Locke, started long before independence. Historically, this concept of limited government is not solely of a Western origin. It can be argued that constitutionalism was also introduced by Islam to its constitutional principle laid down in the Quran and the, and the constitution of Madina. In the seventh century, the Sahifa has become the, sub the subject of extensive studies by many Muslims and non-Muslim scholars and contain basic elements of a modern constitution. After a comparative analysis with other earlier constitutional documents, Professor Muhammad Hamidullah described the Sahifa as the first written constitution in the world based on its comprehensiveness. In other areas of law, through modification or legislation, Malacca had undergone a significant legal transformation when the state made important changes by introducing a legal system and the concept of written law, which was indeed the Shafat law, or to mix with custom. Legal scholars in the story, apart from Malacca laws, Often cited the Dan laws, Dan laws, Fahad laws, the old laws, the 99 laws of Pera, as really done for Islamic influences. The Param Digest that was compiled for Sultan Abdul Wazul by the Shah shows a strong Sharia influence, and Islamic criminal justice system was enforced. Apart from Baha'i, the application of Islamic law also obtains in Johor and Tugana. Two legal codifications modeled on those of Turkey and Egypt, apart from adopting laws of Malacca. Besides having a state constitution that contained Islamic influence, Islamic law, including criminal law, was particularly implemented during the reign of Sultan Zainal Abidin III. The unique administration of Islamic law in Tungano can be seen, for example, when the British agent sit together with Haki, or Muslim judge, in Mahkama, known as Mahkama Balai, or Joint Court, having equal powers administered the Islamic law of the state. The application of Islamic law was not restricted to Islamic personal and family law, but also extended to other branches of Islamic law including land law and law of sale and uh, so on and so forth. The uh, influence of Islam continued and endured even during British colonization. Under the British rule in Malaya, Islam acquired legislative and judicial forms. Even though jurisdiction of Islamic law between uh, were narrowed down to personal and family laws of Muslim, under the British regime, the need for proper administration of Islamic law was recognized. It was envisaged that Sharif matters should be handled by competent authorities 
as early as 1927, in the case of Ramon versus Lacton, Tom Jay, in delivering uh, his judgment of the Supreme Court of the Federated States, wondered whether the Supreme Court was the proper tribunal for dealing with Islamic law. The Federation of Malaya Agreement 1948 has paved the way for independence, for independence. The terms of reference agreed by the Cosmo Conference held in London in 1956 are as follows. To examine the constitutional arrangement to our the Federation of Malaya, taking into account the position and dignities of the Highness Dolores, and to make recommendation for a federal form of constitution based on parliamentary democracy with a bicameral legislature which would include provisions, namely the establishment of strong central government with the states and settlement enjoying a measure of autonomy. The safeguarding of the position of the prestige of the Highness of Highness uh, of the rulers the highness as constitutional rulers of their respective states, a constitutional yang dipertuan besar, and then a uh, yang dipertuan besar to be chosen among the highness the rulers, a common nationality for the whole of the federation, and the safeguarding of the special position of the Malays and the legitimate interests of other communities. The Federation of Malaya 1957 came into being despite the mutual, uh, despite the initial resistance by Penang, Johor, Kelantan for various reasons. When the federal constitution was framed in 1956, matters that had been in practice long before the British colonial administration described as traditional elements were retained by the Recommission and the working paper, working party, apart from other newly introduced provisions and concepts. The traditional elements include the Sultanic, the Islamic religion, and the Malay privileges. The preservation and improvement of constitutional provision relating to Islam are part and parcel of the historical development of the concept of Sultanic. The retention of autochthonous or indigenous characteristics was considered a reason why federal constitutions has endured despite its Anglo-Indian influences. These homegrown features confirmed with Bukunagara and the social contract of 1957 and the basic features of the constitution and basically remain unaltered. The continued existence of interwoven, interwoven additional traditional elements of Islam, Malay and Malay rulers in the constitutional framework of the Federation is essential in order to maintain Malaysia's stability and its peaceful survival and ensure the progress of the country and the working of the constitution itself. All the basic elements agreed and incorporated in the Constitution of Federation of Malaya were also accepted into the Federation, into the Federal Constitution of Malaysia, except with some adjustment and additional provision for Singapore, Sabah, and Sarawak, an effort to distort and dismantle these this, this integrated components has proven to have undesirable political and racial consequences. This is evident in the strong opposition of the Malays, which caused the failure of Malay Union and Malaysian Malaysia slogan, which resulted in the separation of Singapore from the Federation in 1965, and also May 13 racial disturbances in 1969, which caused unnecessary bloodshed, death, and destruction of public and private properties as a result of threatened and unsecure position felt by the Malays 
form the majority of the population of this country. Following the 1969 racial riot, the Malay features of the constitution were enhanced. And since 1990s, the Islamic dimension of the constitution has gained great prominence. Based on previous functional background, the Peninsula Malaysia, which later formed the backfill of Malaysian constitution, <coughs> obviously, the uh, constitutional position of Islam in Malaysia after independence is not purely post-independent phenomenon, as it is firmly rooted in history. Its status reflects Malay and royal tradition, and it has a unique constitutional continuity and development. For example, Article 3 of the present federal constitution has its roots in the constitution of Johor of 1895 and Trangano of 1911 and other unwritten state constitution of the Malay states. Thus, this position preserves the character of this country, which at one, uh, which at one time had, uh, as a backbone of its polity, as well as the legal system. The provision of Islam as enshrined under Article 3 of the federal constitution has been described by Tun Muhammad Sufyan Hashim and Tun Muhammad Saleh Abbas, both former law president of Malaysia, is one of the traditional and basic features of the Malaysian constitution and its historical development constitutes part of the historical development of the concept of uh, monarchical rule. The constitution, including provision of Islam, is the result of intensive and painstaking negotiations involving many parties, namely the Malay rulers, the British, and the Federation of Malaya government, and major races of this country. The position of Islam and the love or practice of other religions, prohibition of propagation of other religions among Muslims, the traditional elements of governance, such as the monarchy, and the Conference of Rulers, which will be elaborated later, are based on local, distinctly, distinctively Malaysian values and cultural traditions. Obviously, the word Islam is clearly and firmly stated in the federal constitution, whereas other religions are mentioned in general. This can be considered a special and elevated place accorded to the religion of Islam in line with the spirit of the constitution and Rukunagara. <coughs> Royal Highness Raja Nazrin Shah in his royal address when officiating Congress Professor Nagara said that the needs of other religions cannot be obstructed so long as they do not touch the sensitivities and sanctity of Islam and contravene laws of the country. All matters pertaining to Islam and the Sharia constitutionally fall within the purview of each individual state in Malaysian federal system, except the federal territories of Kuala Lumpur, Labuan, and Putrajaya, which come under the authority of the federal government. Article 3 does not interfere with the position of each Malay ruler as the head and guardian of Islam in this state. The position of the ruler is the head at the head of the religion of Islam, including all right, privileges, prerogatives, and powers enjoyed by him, as stated in the state constitutions, are unaffected and unimpaired. Thus, the young Pertuanako, a federal monarch elected every five years from among the nine Malay rulers, is not the head of Islam for the entire federation. While continuing to serve as head of Islam in his own state. He is also the head of Islam in the states and federal territories that have no monarchs, namely Malacca, Penang, Sabah, Sarawak and federal territories. However, as the supreme head of the federation, he declares in his oath, in his oath of office, as part of his responsibilities, to protect the religion of Islam. 
the protection of Islam is also part of the responsibilities of other Malay rulers. The royal responsibility is the reminiscence of the original dual principal functions of the Islamic Caliph, that is to safeguard the religion, harass it to deen, and administer the world affairs, the world affairs, that is yes to dunya, world affairs of the people, based on the theory of Islamic government and is founded by a number of classical Muslim juries such as Al-Mawardi, Abu Ya'la and Abu Khaldun, Ibn Khaldun. The federal and state constitution give power to parliament and state legislatures to regulate Islamic religious affairs and to establish religious council to advise the young Lipatuan Agung and the sultans. To advise the young Tuan Agung and the Sultan, the young Tipat Tuan Basar of the Grisambila and Rajat Perlis for their respective states and federal territories. This religious council are concerned solely with the general religious affairs of Muslims and do not have the mandate to intervene in any way with the affairs of other religious groups. The National Council for Islamic Affairs formed at a federal level has no power over the position, rights, privileges, and sovereignty of the ruler at the head of Islam in his own state. The constitutional preservation of the Malay Sultanate, which is associated with the religion of Islam, plays a pivotal role in safeguarding the religion of Islam. There was a divergence of opinion among members of the Cobble Commission on Religion. The British members held the view that the non-Muslim communities were most insistent that a federal provision on Islam should not be extended to the Borneo territories until when they have a fully elected legislature to decide for themselves. The Malayan members, however, recommended that Islam should be the national religion of the new federation. The position of Islam in Sabah Sarawa was originally based on the 20-point memorandum in Intergovernmental Committee Report. This report recommended that the Constitution of Malaysia be based on the Constitution of the Federation of Malaya 1957, subject to amendment covering 23 areas including religion and education. When Malaysia was formed in accordance with the terms of Malaysia Agreement. The state of Sabah and Sarawak were given substantial powers over and above the powers of other states in Malaysia. Before joining Malaysia, Sarawak was under the rule of White Raja. Their policy as also with British policy in the colony of North Borneo or Sabah was to preserve native customs. Before 1963, Sabah and Sarawak were guided by native custom and governed by English laws. The influence of Islam was marginal in Sabah and Sarawak. In these two territories, Islam was recognized but was not associated with states until they became subject to Malaysian Constitution 1963 and its subsequent constitutional amendments. Under the 20-point memorandum on religion, the Sabah Alliance of the five political parties recommended that while there was no objection to Islam being the, colon, being the national religion of Malaysia, there should be no state religion of North Borneo and provision relating to Islam in the federal constitution of Malaya should not apply to North Borneo. The IDC recommended that no amendment was required to Article 3 Clause 1 of the state constitution regarding the position of Islam and Article 3, Clause 3 should also remain the law, conferring the young Dipatuan Ago the position of the head of the religion of Islam in Borneo State. However, the constitutional position of Islam in Borneo State appears to have gradually moved toward greater religious uniformity like their counterparts in Peninsular Malaysia, except in Sarawak, where there is no official religion. 
and Islam is not stated in the state constitution as the religion of the state. But even in Sarawak, the other state, the Sarawak state government established Majlis Agama Islam and Jabatan Mufti with an, with an appointed state mufti. In 1973, state constitution Sabah was amended to make Islam the religion of the state while protecting religious freedom. No similar amendment was effected, was effected to the state constitution of Sabah. There are other similar practices effected by subsequent constitutional amendments. In 1976, Article 3, Clause 3 of the Federal Constitution was amended to require the state constitution of Sao to make provision for conferring on the young Arago a position of head of the religion of Islam in both states. The state constitution of Saba and Sarawak were accordingly amended for this purpose in 1985 and 1981 respectively. This amendment perforce required the state to pass a law to regulate religious affairs and for continuing a religious council to advise and for constituting a religious council to advise the young Tukutuanago on matters relating to the religion of Islam. Apart from the uh, prominent position of Islam specifically stated and guaranteed under Article 3, Clause 1 of the Federal Constitution, there is a host of other constitutional provision in the Federal Constitution that expressly relate to the religion of Islam, some of which explicitly or impliedly strengthen and support the special status of Islam and give privileges and advantages to the religion of Islam as the religion of the federations. These include, for example, Article 5, 8, 11, 12, 37, 38, 74, 76, 150, 100, 153, and 121, clause 1A, and last 160, together with shadows. Um, namely force and nine shadows of the federal constitution. For example, Article 5, briefly, Article 5 plus 4 of the federal constitution, a core recognition to the Sharia court in relation to the rights of the rest of person and the Sharia offenses to the same constitutional protection to safeguard his personal liberty. Article 11 of the Federal Constitution protects to every person his right to profess, practice, and propagate the religion of his choice. No person can be compelled to pay any tax, the proceeds of which are specially allocated in whole or in part for the purposes of a religion other than his own. Freedom of religion also includes the right of every religious group to manage its own religious affairs establish and maintain institution for religious or charitable purposes, acquire own property, acquire and own property, hold and administer it according to law. However, what is unique in Malaysia is that non lays non-Muslims are constitutionally barred from propagating their religious belief and doctrines among the Muslims. While he while they are free to carry on missionary work, not only among themselves, but also among the Muslims. For this purpose, state law and in respect of federal territories of Kuala Lumpur, Labuan and Putrajaya, federal law may control or restrict the propagation of any religion, doctrine, or belief among persons professing the religion of Islam. The Federal Constitution also protects Islamic law and the religion of Islam from amendment or change during the proclamation of emergency under Article 150. Emergency powers are not allowed to extend to any matters of Islamic law, customs of the Malays, native law, and custom in Sabah and Sarawak, religion, citizenship, and language. The Constitution equally guarantees rights of all religions in respect of education 
and prohibit discriminations against citizens on the ground only of religion, race, descent, or place of birth. But the federal and state government are con constitutionally permitted to establish or maintain or assist establishing or maintain some institution or provide this or assist in providing instruction in the religion of Islam and at the same time incur such expenditure as may be necessary for the purpose. Pursuant to this constitutional provision, for example, under the Education Act 1960, any school receiving grants from the government was required to provide Islamic religious instruction to Muslim pupils, provided the number of such pupils in that school was not fewer than 15. Under the Education Act 1996, Islamic religious teachings must be provided if there are five or more Muslim students in such educational institutions. Another important breakthrough as far as Islamic law and Sharia courts are concerned is the amendment of Article 1 to 1 Clause 1 of the Federal Constitution in 1988 by the incorporation of Clause, of clause 1A. Although its objectives have not been fully achieved, Article 1 to 1 Clause 1A provides that the two federal courts referred to in Article 1 to 1 Clause 1 shall have no jurisdiction in respect of any matter within the jurisdiction of the Sharia Court. The purpose of the constitutional amendment is to clarify the constitutional ambit of Malaysia's dual system of civil and Sharia Court and prevent the civil court from hearing any matter that falls within the exclusive jurisdiction of the Sharia Court and stop the recurrence of previous interference by the civil courts on matters which should rightly be considered by the Sharia court. However, this jurisdictional imbroglio remains due to two main reasons. First, cases may involve Muslim and non-Muslim litigants, and the same case could concern, could concern mixed issues of Sharia and civil law. But it, can, it cannot be denied that uh, the inclusion of Clause 1A can be considered a booster to the status of Sharia court as it gives an independence to the Sharia court to exercise their jurisdiction without any interference from the civil court and to independently develop Malaysian Islamic jurisprudence. The status of Islam is influence and connection with the state Malaysia have been reinforced by the various provisions relating to Islam in the constitution of states constituting the Malaysian federations. All states in Malaysia contain provision uh, on Islam as the religion of state except Sarawak. Before the formation of Malaysia, the policy of White Raja and that of British in the colony of North Borneo or Sabah, now Sabah, was to preserve native custom and Islam was then considered part of local custom. The Islamic influence is particularly manifested in the constitution of Malay states the laws of the constitution of Johor, for example, uh, that is the earliest written constitution in Malaysia, beginning with Bismillah al-Rahman al-Rahim, and then followed by stating that Article 2 provides that the sovereign must be a Malay of royal blood, a male and male and Muslim. There is a Jumaah, Jumaah pankwanikri, style as I will highly well actually whose members shall be of the Malay race, professing the Muslim religion, and subject of his kindness. So this is traceable to the classical Islamic political theory of Ahlul Hadi wal Abdi, whose function was to be like a Khalifa, as expounded by al mawardi Article 57 declares Islam is the religion of the state of Johor. Article 3, clause 2 of the second part of the constitution 
still that no person shall be appointed to be Menteri Besar unless he is of the Malay race and professes the Muslim religion. Although the ruler may in his discretion dispense with any provision in Article 3, Clause 2, if in his opinion it is necessary to do so. It is the duty of the Sultan to rule the state based on justice, wisdom, and protect and respect the religion of Islam. This is stated in his oath of office as the ruler. In the original Jawi version of the Tunganu Constitution 1911, Article 51 described the government of Tunganu as Karaja al Islamiyah Malayuya and Islam as the state religion. The description of the nature of state is sometimes found in the ordinary legislation. For example, in Paham Dajet, declared that Paham was the Islam, Islamic state. By the discovery of gold coin in 1914, it was argued that Islamic State used to exist in Kelantan. However, no specific date was given. The Constitution of Malay State contained provisions that require that only a person of the Malay race who professes the religion of Islam can be appointed to be the Malay rulers, Menteri Besar and State Secretary. This provision which existed in the state constitution prior to Mordeca Day are saved by Article 8, Clause 5, Clause E of the federal constitution. Like the constitution of Johor, the constitution of the state of Kedah, another example, commences with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim and is followed by Salawat to the Prophet. The appointment of sovereign ruler must be based on Hukum Shara. The Sultan is to be appointed or conferred by the Council of Succession. By the succession, Council of Succession, at least one of its members must be a person learned in Islamic law. Subject to Article 12 of the Constitution, the sovereign shall be a person who is a Malay, a royal blood, a descendant of Qadar's sovereign, a male, and of the Muslim religion of Ahlu As-Sunnah wal Jamaah, and similar provision is found in the Constitution of Berlis. In Sabah and Sarawak, at the time of the 1963 merger, there was no state religion in Sabah and Sarawak. However, under the present constitution of the state of Sabah, Islam is now accepted as the official religion of the state. And like the wording of the federal constitution, the state and other religions may be practiced in peace and harmony in any part of the state. In Sarawak, although Islam is not the religion of the state of Sarawak, the state legislative assembly, as in Sabah, is also tasked to make provisions for regulating Islamic religious affairs and for establishing a council to advise the young diplomats to, to advise the young diplomats. There are some uh, constitutional um, principles uh, principle of the uh, some uh, principle of constitutional interpretations of the Malaysian Constitution. Uh, the judiciary, as one of the main organs of state, uh, plays a crucial role as the final arbiter of the meaning application of the constitutional provisions. There seems to be a number of approaches adopted by the Malaysian courts in the understanding and interpretation of the Constitution. Principle of constitutional interpretation are not codified or even stated in the constitution itself, and the Malaysian judiciary is not necessarily consistent or predictable in these matters. However, some principle of constitutional interpretation were developed by the Malaysian judges. It is pertinent to examine some of these principles adopted by the court. This will be followed by some analysis of the approaches in cases having some bearing on the position of Islam 
and the potential role that can be played by the court. Generally, the method used range from literal to close, so as not to stretch or pervert the language of the Constitution to a broad construction as to give life to the document as a living piece of legislation where its provision must be con construed broadly and not in a pedantic way. There are a few judicial decisions, for example, involving the interpretation of the provision of Islam as the religion of the Federation, as entrenched in the Article 3, Class 1 of the Federal Constitution. One of these cases is the case of Chiloma Ben Jesu versus Public Prosecutor, 1988. Another case is case of Mio Atiko Rahman bin Isha versus Fatima bin Tisi. The judge took the view that Islam in the constitution is a complete way of life, not just a more, not just a mere set of ritual. It is the primary religion which takes precedence over other religions in Malaysia. And this is the implication of the stipulation of Islam as the religion of the Federation. Justice Muhammad Noor Abdullah also opined that Islam as the religion of the Federation in Article 3 of the Constitution should be given proper interpretation in the sense that the government is responsible to safeguard, promote and spread the religion of Islam. The opinion of Justice Muhammad Noor Abdullah is currently in accord with the function of the young Tepatuanago as pronounced in his post of office inter alia to protect the religion of Islam. The decision is further fortified with the Herald case which states that Article 3 is no mere declaration but imposes a positive obligation on the Malaysian state to protect, defend and promote Islam and its injunction by appropriate action. The constitutional interpretation of Islam as the religion of the Federation in the Malaysian context is still open to other possibilities and based on the conclusion from the two cases mentioned earlier, the meaning and scope of Islam in the Federal Constitution can perhaps be described in the words of one commentator and constitutional scholar as in the state of flux. Other judicial interpretation that has come that has some bearing on the position of Islam related to scope of freedom of religion. For example, in the case of Dao Mama versus others, uh, Dao Mama and others versus Majlis uh, Ugama for that standard line uh, the judge held that freedom of religion under Article 11 of the Federal Constitution does not include the right to apostatize. His lordship observed that no, that to, to include the right to renounce the religion of Islam in the is uh, in religion of Islam um, would stretch. Uh, the, the right to include the religion, uh, the right to renounce the religion of Islam in the right of religious freedom would stretch the scope of Article 11, Clause 1, to a ridiculous height. There has been a growing tendency of the civil court not to interfere with the protection of the Sharia court, particularly with regard to cases of religious conversion into or out of Islam. There has been a controversy on the interpretation of Article 12, Clause 4 of the Federal Constitution pertaining to the issue of who should have the right to determine the religion of a child under the age of 18 years old. Article 12, Clause 4 states that for the purposes of Clause 3, the religion of a person under the age of 18 years shall be decided by his parent or guardian. The Federal Court, in the case of uh, Subhashini, ruled in 2007 that a husband who had embraced Islam had the right to convert the children in his faith without a consent, to his faith without a consent. Recently, a Hindu mother in Indira Gandhi was allowed to challenge 
the validity of the unilateral conversion of her three children by her Muslim company, Ex-Husband Muhammad Ridwan. The federal court in this radio interfaith custody battle ruled that the unilateral conversion was invalid. The court said, in contrast to earlier decision, the consent of both parents in the civil marriage must be obtained before a certificate of conversion to Islam could be issued. There were mixed reactions over the ruling. In this situation, solutions must be found so that the interests of Muslim Islamic faith are also given due consideration. However, in some other cases, seeing the constitutional amendment of Article 12, Article 1 to 1, Clause 1, the civil court had generally shown great reluctance and restraint in any matter where there was the slightest whiff of an Islamic religious issue. It appears that this is not only confined to matters within the jurisdiction of the Sharia court, but in any issue that is connected with Islamic law, whether it is within or outside the jurisdiction of the Sharia court. The civil court were extremely reluctant to pronounce a judgment even if issues, even if, if issues of jurisdiction, constitutionality and human rights were involved. The civil court had declined to hear cases involving fundamental rights such as where state laws on apostasy clash with the Article 11 of the Federal Constitution through expensive construction of Sharia court jurisdiction and their exclusive legal competence over matters falling within their jurisdiction. Another important principle that should be mentioned here is that uh, that is the um, <coughs> construction adopted by the court um, is that the federal constitution must be considered as a whole and no one constitutional provision can be construed in isolation. In the case of the publication Sindhriya Barhar, for example, the federal court held that Article 10 of the federal constitution must be read in particular with Article 3.1, that is provision on Islam, Article 11, Freedom of Religion, 74 plus 2, and Article 1 to 1 plus 2. According to the court, Article 10 of the Federal Constitution on Freedom of, of Expression needs to be interpreted harmoniously with the above-mentioned article. The state legislatures are empowered to restrict freedom of expression granted under Article 11 plus 1 plus uh, Article 10 plus 1 plus a, which is contrary to Islamic law as provided in state leads to punish offenses against the precept of Islam and this power does not go beyond the constitutional framework of freedom of speech enshrined in Article 10 of the Federal Constitution. Another point that we would like to highlight here is the relating to the Islamic law as a source of law. The federal constitution recognizes Islamic law as one of the sources of Malaysian law, although it is not specifically mentioned in the definition of law under Article 160, Clause 2 of the federal constitution. However, Islamic law is clearly provided in the nine shadow of the federal constitutions. The states and federal territories, two state legislatures and parliament, respectively, are uh, authorized to enact Islamic law on those matters enumerated in the state list. It was argued by Allah Iraham III, uh, Emeritus Professor Ahmad Ibrahim and Marhum, that the word include in the definition of law means that it is not exhaustive and may subsume other sources, including Sharia law, which is unwritten. The same view was expressed by Emeritus Professor Datuk Shah Salim Farooqi. He said the definition is inclusive and not exclusive, and it leaves the door open 
to the doctrine of equity, justice, morality, religion, and international law into the majestic network of Malaysian law. And uh, also, <coughs> there is reference to Hukum Shara. Hukum Shara, reference to Hukum Shara in general, uh, in addition to specific legal provision, is traceable in many state and federal legislation on the administration of Islamic law in Malaysia. For example, on many occasions, state and federal laws, Islamic law, require reference to Hukum Shara for purposes of interpretation. Um, interpretation of certain aspects of Islamic law. For example, the Sharia Court Civil Procedure Federal Territories Act 1998 provide that in the event of a lacuna or where any matter is not expressly provided for in this act, the court shall apply to come Sharia. Sharia law also has the potential to play a critical role in the development of the Malaysian legal system. Sharia law has already been listed as one of the sources of the Malaysian constitutional law. This is stated in the book written by Professor Shah Salim Faruqi. In view of the Islamic recession and more and more institutions being Islamized, it was suggested by one by one emotional scholar that Islam would conceivably be a possible third source of Malaysian constitutionalism in the future. The possibility is perhaps not far-fetched, since the Islamic cultural approach, as will be shown later, is universal in its fundamental principle. But the detailed application is a commodity and character that allows ample room for practices of local variation and indigenous adaptation to suit various changing circumstances. Even in some of the present constitutional practices, it can also be argued that Islamic substances and principles have already been indirectly adopted. In future and wider interpreting perspective, there have been calls from the time to time that Malaysia should develop a whole common law, although its meaning is surrounded with ambiguity, and it has long been suggested that Islamic law should be part of the process. As suggested by a renowned Malaysian constitutional expert, the possibility of the contribution of Islamic law the development of Malaysian common law has not been ruled out or sidelined. Apart from the constitutional protection, there are other protections found in the ordinary legislative, um, ordinary legislative, in ordinary, in ordinary, in ordinary laws. Yeah? Um, so we have, for example, provisions under the ordinary law that protects the religion of Islam. In addition to specifically direct or indirect constitutional provision pertaining to Islam, there is a plethora of ordinary legislation in the form of state enactment and of parliament that deal with the religion of Islam and the administration of Islamic law in, in Malaysia. Parliament and state legislative assemblies authorize to make laws in matters within their respective powers under the federal system, under the federal system, including laws establishing the Sharia court, administration Islamic law, or Islamic religious council to deal with the administration of general Islamic religious affairs. Religion is also protected under federal laws of general application. For example, there are several provisions in the penal code which, con which created criminal offenses against, against religion. We have also laws regulating halal products. <laughs> Malaysia adopts a federal system of government based on the agreed established distribution of powers between the federal and state government. The original and modified nature of federal state relations were respectively proposed by the Recommission for the Original Federation of Malaya. 
Although Islam Islamic law are a state matter except for federal territories, Parliament is not entirely excluded from legislative competence to enact laws based on Sharia in respect of matters which are not within the state list or within the federal federal list. Since the independence in 1957, as part of the terms of reference agreed at the Constitutional Conference in London, Malaysia has been practicing a system of constitutional monarchy and parliamentary democracy based on a modified form of Westminster model, which according to al Marhum Sultan Adlan Shah, adopted the essential features of the Westminster model and built into the traditional features of Malay society. This system and other basic features enshrined in the constitution of Islam and the religion of the federation had been retained when Malaysia was formed in 1963. Malaysian constitutional framework recognized the traditional features of Islam and Malay society with the Sultanate system as the apex as a distinct feature of federal constitution. With regard to policy decision, Professor Andrew Harding observed, typically of the style of constitutional drafting of the 1950s, the Mateka constitution gave, an, gave, no, uh, gave no concrete indication of the type of state ideology that was envisaged, nor does it set out any direct principle or priorities of government. The fundamental policies and principal operation of the new state were therefore in practice left to the, to the political leadership of the new nation to mold over time. In the words of Malay proverb, the kite strings were in the hands of local leaders and where the kite would go was uh, for them to decide. That is the position of um, Islam in the federal constitution and federal constitution in Malaysia. In order to, <coughs> to appraise the position and the relation between Islam and state in Malaysia, it is important to understand also the relationship between Islam and state according to, according to Islam. Islam as a complete, as a complete religion, it encompasses matters relating to state and government. And government. There are some issues surrounding Islam and state. One of the questions that continues to be debated and has caused considerable argument among modern thinkers is the question of definition of Islamic state and relationship between Islamic religion and state, and whether there is any readily available or specific model of Islamic state or government to be emulated at the present time, or Islam merely provide general principle of Islamic state and constitution. Other issues relate to the nature, interpretation, and application or translation the concept of Islamic State and Islamic constitutional principle in a modern constitutional system. At a practical level, certain interpretation of the concept adopted by some groups has led to disunity or even violence among the Muslim societies that weaken the Muslim Ummah. One of the aspects of Islam that has been um, <coughs> right um, with regard to the um, Islamic constitutional principle, Islam has its own constitutional approach. Islam, although all embracing and comprehensive in its code, as asserted in the Quran. There has been a general consensus that in so, in so far as state and constitution are concerned, it only laid down fundamental principles of state or government or constitution 
without reflecting any specific detail. Thus, there is no relief scheme on which the adverse of government can be directed at all times and in all places, whereas there are guiding principles and norms which are essential to be followed in the domain of politics to stay craft. There is nothing as form of government as the phrase connotes in, the, in modern political pattern, which may be discernible from the Quran and the hadiths of the prophets. There are two approaches adopted by Muslim scholars in discussing the principle of Islamic state, government or constitution. One is a brief and concise analysis of the general principle or features as advocated by Abu Qadir Kauta, and a more detailed description of such principle understood or derived respectively from the Quran and Sunnah. Despite some differences, in the number of this principle and the formulation given by the Muslim jurist was followed, the flowing may be considered as may be considered uh, the flowing may be considered as the main and fundamental principle. One supremacy of Sharia or religion of Islam and the rule of law as guarantee or leadership or Islamic leadership responsibility, masmulia, trust, amana, accountability, muhasaba, consultation, shura, justice, and rights and duties of the ruler. The concept of sovereignty of Sharia doesn't mean that Islamic system of government is theocratic in a Western sense, where the rights and freedom of the people, including non-Muslim, are denied. Their interests, needs, and welfare uh, will be taken into consideration and they will be involved in law and decision making processes. Ample room is provided to the juries, policy makers and the people through the principle of jihad, shura and siyasa, sharia to work out required detail for very policies and enact laws and regulations within the parameters of religions. It's fundamental and Maqasid al-Sharia. With regard to the application of principles, some Muslim scholars have made effort to draft what they call Islamic constitution, however not specifically addressed to a particular country. For example, the Islamic Research Academy al Azhar University appointed in 1981 a committee of its scholars work on the Islamic theory of state and supplication in modern time. The committee was also entrusted with the task of drafting the Islamic Muslim model in accordance with Sharia. In this draft, it stated the Muslim form one Ummah. However, it is possible to have civil nation state within the Islamic single Ummah with different forms of government. The nature of form of system of government is not eternal but can be subject to a subsequent review if necessary, as in the case of the Constitution of Islamic Republic of Pakistan, 1973, where it was reviewed in 1983 by the Ansari Commission, Ansari Commission, Ansari Constitutional Commission. In Malaysia, there has been um, there are different opinions on the description about Malaysia. The endless debates on Islam in Malaysia revolve around the question whether Malaysia or federal constitution is Islamic or secular. Various descriptions range from, from secular, neither secular nor Islamic, hybrid and Islamic. Except the later description, none of the other characterization referred to Islamic theory of state or government. We have um, also some definitions of Islamic states given by some jurists, although this definition was not provided in the Quran and the Sutra. <coughs> 
The Quran Hadith do not provide a hard and fast definition of Islamic State and Confucian. Those sources only lay down principle and essential criteria governing state, government and constitution, including those tasks to carry out public duties. As a result, Muslim theories and contemporary scholars have, have, have some differences in their definition and description. The general tendency among Muslim scholars has been to describe and focus on the objective characteristics or attributes of features of Islamic State, whether briefly, whether briefly uh, or in detail. There are some issues raised regarding, uh, regarding um, the constitution of uh, Malaysia. For example, the issue of secularism that, um, that I would like to highlight briefly. The term secular means non-preferential, non-interventionist terms towards our religion. It is variously defined as belonging to the world as distinguished from the church and religion. Pertaining to the doctrine of secularism, Secularism defines the belief that religion and religious considerations should not be deliberate, should be deliberately omitted from the temporal affairs. The absence, but under the federal constitution, the state or Malaysia the federal constitution is involved in matters pertaining to Islamic affairs and government funds may underwrite the administration of Islamic religion and its law and Islamic educational institutions. The absence of the word secular in the present constitution and the fact that the word was not included by the Reconstitutional Commission and the Working Party or Committee as it was originally suggested by the Alliance Party in the final draft of the Madrid Constitution is significant. It can be argued that if the word was necessary, it would have been firmly inserted in the constitution. The, um, <clears throat> historically, it is arguable that Malaysia, Malaysian consideration, um, historically it is arguable that Malaysian nationalism started in the middle of the 15th century during the reign of Sultan Muzaffar a long time ago. The modern idea of, of nationalism is often referred to English political philosopher. And there has been uh, a possible influence of Islamic political thought on the, on the present Islam uh, political system in the world today based on some research by researchers and, and scholars. And in evaluating this uh, concept of Islamic constitution, there are also other principles that should be given should be taken into consideration. For example, Maqas al-Sharia and the concept of Siyasa al-Sharia. Siyasa al-Sharia. Right, the next point I would like to highlight is that the challenges relation, um, in relationships and the way forward. Despite, uh, there are three dimensions of relationship in relation to challenges to be examined. First, issues and challenges in relation to Islam and state in the federal constitution seen from a national perspective. Second, relation between Islam and state from the Islamic constitutional point of view. And third, uh, the position of Islam and state in the federal constitution viewed from the Islamic constitutional theory. As discussed earlier, Principles of Islamic state national law are universal in nature, thus they are flexible and can be fit into any structure of state in terms of details, whether parliamentary, presidential, or monarchy, or other forms of government, provided that they confirm to Islamic fundamental national principle. However, there are issues of interpretation and implication and lack of tolerance among some Muslims who regard the existing modern system of government as something 
which is completely alien or inimical, inimical to Islam without a proper understanding of the two concepts and reality in which such concept is to be applied. As a result, several approaches were adopted um, were adopted in the name of establishing Islamic State on Agara Islam because of a lack of knowledge or a misguided notion of Islamic State. Some even resorted to extreme methods and means which are again the holistic teachings of Islam and shared principle. The true understanding of the Islamic functional approach is extremely imperative in any evaluation and determining the right course of action to be taken regarding the existing functional system, particularly in the application in its application in contemporary um, situation. In connecting Islam with the state and the federal constitution, one should not only look at the specific provision relating to Islam, but also other provisions which contain Islam substances, although they do not mention the word Islam. The Prophet has said as, as uh, a useful constitutional precedent on this matter, where there was no single sentence in the constitution of Madina, including his name, containing the word Islam except in two provisions relating to the requirement of reference to Allah and Rasul. In case of the occurrence of a dispute or differences, what is important here seems to be the content and the substance of the Sahifa rather than his name. The hybrid interpretation of the constitution by some commentators came to the conclusion that Malaysia is not a full-fledged Islamic state based on some Islamic features, namely specific protection of Islam and specific status enjoyed by Islam and the Muslim, and also what they describe as secular features. The conclusion was reached apparently without examining what Islamic state actually means based on the various Islamic thought, Islamic political thought in the holistic understanding of the concept of state in Islamic perspective. Even from purely Malaysian constitutional point of view, according to Allah, that Justice Hashim Yuk-e-Sani, Malaysia can legally hold itself out as a Muslim country, although not a lot, based on, on Islamic tenets. Under the present constitutional uh, framework, there are four methods at government disposal in order to further strengthen and enhance the relation between Islam and state. Firstly, constitutional amendment, if deemed absolutely necessary, in order to make certain a disputed matter, if any. Second, amendment through normal legislative process and greater harmonization of laws. Third, through the enhancement of constitutional practices and lastly, but not the least, Islamic oriented formulation of public policies. The first method is practically more difficult and challenging under the present political circumstances, particularly when it involves a constitutional amendment, although it may not be entirely ruled out. The federal constitution under Article 159 provide for methods and procedures for its own amendment. Thus, the Constitution does not absolutely ban any constitutional amendment or other legal changes. As Malaysia is a democratic and multiracial country, there must be general understanding and public awareness to ensure that main political power and top leadership should always be in the hands of the Muslims who form the majority of population in Malaysia but should also be fair and just to other communities as firmly stipulated in the federal constitution and very much emphasized in Islam. This suggestion is made not out of racial discrimination but consistent with the character of this country and the previous constitutional practice based on historical and local considerations and generally close relation between Islam and state in Malaysia. 
the Malaysian judiciary also has the potential and, and can play its part in the application, interpretation of the Constitution, especially with regard to relationship between Islam and state and the position of Islam in the federal constitution which has not been completely explored. In view of the myriad of constitutional provision having some bearing on Islam, the federal court is expected to play its creative role in evolving the harmonious construction in its interpretation so that Islam is actually seen to occupy the right position in light of the federal constitution. Constitution. To conclude my lecture, um, in Islamic constitutional uh, perspective, the connection between Islam and state is an inseparable one. However, the notion of this interwoven relationship sometimes gives rise to some issues of interpretation and application and misconception among the Muslims as well as non-Muslims, such as misconception, uh, such misconception generally have created fears and anxieties, particularly in the West and among the non-Muslims, as Islamic State has, has often been associated with alleged discrimination and deprivation of human rights, particularly those of non-Muslim and women. As it has been shown, this apprehension from the true, true precepts of Islam is baseless. Islamic national theory, like other branches of law, is deeply rooted in divine guidance, but at the same time, its approach is accommodating to contemporary environment. Misconception about the notion and interpretation of Islamic State and Constitution also caused conflict among some Muslim societies. And between the rulers and the rule, sometimes the implication is fatal. Sometimes the implication is fatal. Or destructive, or divisive. A proper understanding of the Islamic notional approach in universal value of the fundamental principle of state and constitution will make them more tolerant and relevant in all situations, including in a multiracial society in Malaysia. It can be argued that generally Malaysia could be described as an Islamic country or state, although Islamic law may not be fully implemented as Islam seen in a larger picture or holistic perspective is more than mere legal rules. Its policy decisions in some cases are partly based on consideration of Udil Amri or political authorities based on the doctrine of Siyasat Sharia and balancing and, and prioritization of various interests. Furthermore, the juristic definition of Islamic State do not specify the degree of the implementation of Sharia before a state could qualify to be Islamic. What is certain, however, the dual function of the Islamic administration as defined by Muslim jurists, that is to protect the religion of Islam and manage the world affairs of the country uh, found in the federal constitution. That concludes my lecture. Thank you very much. to our guest of honor for his unwearing support towards this inaugural lecture. 
I would like to call upon Yang Berbahagia Professor Dr. Haji Abdul Zaman Musa to present a gift to Yang Berbahagia Professor Dr. 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 Musa Ahmad. Thank you, Yang Berbahagia Prof. With that, we have come to the end of this inaugural lecture. Respected guests, ladies and gentlemen, once again, on behalf of the organizer, the faculty of Sharia and Law Yusin, we would like to thank all of you for your presence. It is hoped that this inaugural lecture will continue to be a platform for the meeting of intellectual minds, as well as help strengthen